Okay, hello. It is two o'clock and welcome back to the Real English Party online Tuesday afternoon book club. And uh, today we are reading, as usual on Tuesday afternoon, we are reading uh, uh, Fairy Tale. Fairy Tale, a book, a novel by Stephen King that was re recently written and published. And uh, Hope you're all doing well out there. If you're watching this live or if you're watching this on recording, that would be fine. Hopefully everything is well. I'm just waiting for my tablet to boot up so that we can actually read the book. Uh, but so in the meantime, I wonder how you guys are doing this. Everybody doing okay in this heat? Uh, I know I was out there teaching kindergarten this morning and I had to take maybe two showers just this morning because uh, it was just so hot, just to walk outside, you know, I would be I would be sweaty within five minutes. So yeah, I hope you're taking care of yourself. We are at like peak, peak heat right now, fortunately. I am indoors in uh, under air conditioning and hopefully you can understand everything that I'm saying, right? Because I'm speaking at native speed at this time. But in any event, now I'm here, we're ready to begin our reading. Uh, let's just do a little recap. As we know, this is a story about a boy named Charlie. Uh, we, we're calling him a boy because this boy, the story starts when he's a child, about 10 years old or so. And, uh, you know, he loses his mother. His father becomes an alcoholic. He prays to God that he would do anything if his father would recover from his alcoholism. And his father then does recover from his alcoholism. So the boy feels like he owes God something. And he feels he has the chance to repay God when he helps an old man in an old spooky house. Uh, he was just, it's a spooky house in his neighborhood that they used to call the psycho home. Of course, it was really called the, the Bowditch house because the old man's name was Mr. Bowditch. And what had happened was while he was cycling home one winter afternoon from school, uh, he noticed that the, Mr. Bowditch's dog was sort of moaning and, 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 and whimpering. And so it attracted him to go into the backyard of their house only to discover that Mr. Bowditch needed help. He had fallen off of a ladder and broken his leg and was not able to move. And yet he was stuck out in the freezing cold of winter. So of course, uh, the boy immediately called 911, helped Mr. Bowditch by giving him some old, very, very old, of painkillers. Uh, and of course, the ambulance did come and they took M Mr. Bowditch to the hospital. Uh, the only problem now is that, well, Mr. Bowditch needed someone to take care of his old dog. So the boy agrees to take care of the dog. He would uh, maybe feed the dog that evening and, and the next morning. And it looks like a uh, uh, the boy is starting to develop a bit of a, a relationship with Mr. Bowditch's old, old dog. So we'll see how that goes as we go forward. And apparently, Mr. Bowditch was very secretive and didn't want the boy to know very much about his house. So he told the boy, he made the boy promise that he wouldn't snoop around. Of course, uh, the boy, Charlie, Charlie is is yet, yet he is still attracted uh, to a shed in the backyard, noticing that it's not big enough to be a garage for a car and a, a bit larger than a tool shed. So he was interested in snooping around there, but of course the shed was locked and the boy did not have the key. So because of that, it, is this, it was decided that the boy would just stay in the living room and take care of the dog. And of course, the boy did, from what I understand, notice when he was in the house that although the house was quite clean, it was in disrepair. Uh, if you remember what that what that means from the last time, uh, the last time we said disrepair, basically it means that the house had not been had had many things that needed to be repaired or maintained. Uh, so, of course. Uh, the boy agrees, or, or or decides, I should say, he decides to, I guess, wake up early the next day. Uh, he's going to be a little bit late for school. He he already called ahead and planned for that because I guess he wanted to go and take care of the dog. And we can assume he was also wanted to perhaps uh, repair the house. 
right? We can assume he also wanted to do that. All right, so that's where we are right now. Uh, it does look like now my screen is beginning to share, so we will be able to look at the book on my tablet in short order. And then once that happens, we can begin our reading. I feel like I'm missing something from the last part of the story. So uh, let me see. I, I'm pretty sure, yeah, he, well, we also, we know that the boy did also visit the house again later that night just because he wanted to check on the dog. And it was probably a good idea because the dog was actually quite scared. And so he was able to comfort the dog by finding an old shirt of Mr. Bowditch that the dog could lay on and be comforted by his owner's scent. So I know that that's, what, that's one thing that has happened. And so now uh, we, I'm assuming he's going to visit Mr. Bowditch at the hospital. He's also going to help Mr. Bowditch fix his house. I'm thinking that these, these things are going to happen. So let's see if they do happen. All right, so we are beginning chapter three. And the chapter three is called A Hospital Visit, Quitters Never Win, The Shed. Right, okay, so then that pretty much brings up a lot of what we've talked about already. So let us begin. I guess you have apps closing here. Let's close those up. Okay, let us begin. And there we go. Okay. The psycho house looked less psycho by the dawn's early light. Although the mist rising from all that high grass did give it a gothic air, Radar must have been waiting because she began thudding against the bolted dog door as soon as she heard me on the steps. We were loose and spongy. Another accident happened. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Let me try that again. Which were loose and spongy. Another accident waiting to happen and another chore waiting for someone to do it. Sorry about that. My tablet seems to have a ghost. <laughs> That's probably too small for you to be able to read. Let's maximize that if we can. Oh no, and my tablet is frozen. Okay, so it's quite frozen, So, oh, but it looks like it's back now. It's hopefully it, it will work properly. And so we were right here where he says, easy girl, yeah, right here. Oh. Okay, tablet's not doing so good. Oh, well, okay, well, it, yeah, that's right, where it says easy girl, there we go. So, easy girl, I said, putting the key in the lock. You'll sprain something. She was all over me as soon as the door was open, jumping it up and putting her front paws on my leg, arthritis be damned. She followed me into the kitchen and watched, tail wagging, as I scraped one last full cup from her diminishing food supply. While she ate, I texted dad and asked if he would stop at a place called Pet Pantry on his lunch hour or after work and pick up a bag of dog food. Origin Regional Red. Then I sent another saying I'd pay him back and Mr. Bowditch, Bowditch would pay me. I considered and sent a third one. Better get a big bag. I didn't take, it didn't take me long, but radar, radar was already done. Okay, we'll stop there for a moment. One, because my tablet has frozen, but also because at this point we should be able to top, stop and look at some of the words or phrases I don't think there were any real new words or phrases that that we need to look at, but I think we, he did use a phrase that I think would be useful for you to know. He said, arthritis be damned. So I think it's important that you probably know that kind of phrase. When we say something, be damned. 
Now, now that expression is not like we are cursing something. That's, a, that's not exactly what it means. When we say something be damned, it means that despite the thing that we're talking about, we are going to do something. So we don't care about it. So in this case, this old dog had arthritis, right? So it's very hard for this dog to walk, much less jump up. But of course, in this case, this uh, radar, the dog, she, as soon as he came in, was all over him. She was dump jumping on him. She had her paws on his leg. And, when he, and because of that, he says, arthritis be damned. What that means is that she didn't seem to care about her arthritis, which was making her, it hard for her to walk or to jump. She was so excited, it was like she forgot about her arthritis. And that's basically what we say when we say something be damned. Like for example, if, uh, if you're on a diet and you're watching what you eat, but you just get so hungry and you see something really sweet, probably not very healthy, you might eat it anyway and say, my diet be damned. Right. In that case, what that basically means is that you do not or you are not going to care about your diet in this case, that in fact, you, you don't care about it, at least not in this moment. So you would say, my diet be damned. Mm -hmm. So it looks like my tablet was not really functioning very well as it seems is often the case. So what I will do instead is I'm going to use my smartphone, which if I'm being honest, probably will show a very small scheme, screen to read. So hopefully you, you'll just bear with me with that. And uh, well, hopefully we can get through it. I guess we'll just read in smaller portions because the screen will be smaller. Okay, going back to Stephen King's fairy tale. Okay, so now you should be able to see a smaller screen. And we've got there to where he says, better get a big, a big bag, right? Okay. So he says, it didn't take me long, but Radar was already done. She brought me the monkey and she brought me the monkey and dropped it beside my chair. Then burped. Excuse you, I said, and soft tossed the monkey. She pounced and brought it back. I tossed it again. And while she was going after it, my phone binged. It was dad. No problem. I gave her another toss. But instead of going after it, she limped, trotted down the hall of old reading matter and outside. Not knowing if there was a leash, I broke off another piece of pecan sandy to coax her back in if it needed. I was pretty sure it would do the job. Radar was the original chow hound. Getting her in didn't turn out to be a problem. She squatted in one place to do her number one and in another to do an, her number two. She came back, looked at the steps the way a mountaineer might look at a tough climb, then made her way halfway up. She sat for a moment, then managed the rest. I wasn't sure how long she'd be able to do that without help. Okay, so let's go back there. Okay, we have, there's one phrase I would like to point out here. There may be very many words that you don't know. Like for example, pounced, right? It says here, oh sorry, it says here, I, excuse you, I said, and soft tossed the monkey. She pounced and brought it back. So what does that mean to pounce? Well, when, in, when a four-legged animal jumps on something as if to attack, that means pounce. We use the word pounce when something jumps on something as if to attack, or sometimes we do that playfully. Animals do that playfully. So it's really to attack something by jumping on it, you pounce. So she pounced on the monkey toy, uh, you know, playfully, I'm assuming, and then brought it back so that it could be tossed again. Okay, so that's one thing I'd want to make sure that you could, you would be able to understand. Another word you might not have heard of before was the word coax. Okay, so it says, in the sentence actually reads, I broke off another piece of pecan sandy 
to coax her back in if needed. So the dog has gone outside the house and he can't, he doesn't have a leash or a chain or anything to tie to the dog to, to pull the dog. So he broke off a piece of pecan sandy. If you can remember, remember from our last read, pecan sandy is a kind of cookie we imagined, right? And of course it's a piece of cookie that the dog liked to eat. So he he, bit off, he broke off a piece of pecan candy to coax her back in, back into the house if needed. So what does coax mean? Can we, can we make a guess at that? What this word coax means? To coax her back into the house? So if you thought the word coax meant something like convince or persuade or to get someone to do something, you are correct. Yes, coax basically just means to, to make someone choose to do something or to convince someone to do something right okay so now he can't pull the dog in with a leash because he couldn't find a leash but at least he could convince the dog to come back in the house using the piece of pecan sandy or piece of cookie that the dog might want to eat by come we come back in inside the house in, in order to eat okay and so that is pretty much as far as we got on that i don't think there's much more i would like to read uh yeah I think aside from that, we're pretty much, we're ready to go, to read on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Gotta go, I said. See you later, Gator. We'd never had a dog, so I didn't know how expressive their eyes could be, especially up, up close and personal. Hers told me not to go. I would have been happy to stay, but as that poem says, I had promises to keep. I stroked her a few times and told her to be good. I remembered reading somewhere, somewhere that a dog ages seven years for each one of ours. Just the rule of thumb, surely, but at least a way of the figure. And what did that mean to a dog, time-wise? If I came back at six to feed her, that would be about 12 hours of my time. Would that be 84 hours of her for her? Three and a half days. If so, no wonder she was so happy to see me. Plus, she had to be missing Mr. Bowditch. I locked the door, went down the steps, and looked toward the place where she'd done her business. Policing the backyard was another chore that could be that could use doing. Unless Mr. Bowditch had done it himself. With all that high grass, it was impossible to tell. If he hadn't, someone should. Okay, okay. So we're gonna stop there for a moment. See, this is a this is a phrase I have not heard before. He says, policing the backyard, policing the backyard, right? Uh, we, I'm not, I don't usually see the word used this way, to police, when we think of police, we usually think of it as a noun, right? And that's, those are the people who patrol the area and search to make sure there are no, there's no crime or anything bad happening, right? These are the people, if there's trouble, you call the police. And of course, to police normally is, as a verb, to patrol an area to make sure everything's okay, as a police officer would. In this case, he said policing the backyard was another chore. I'm assuming that then in this area, they call policing the backyard really just maintaining an area, just checking for damage and repairing if, if you find it. So that's another way we can use policing. You know, it just means, you know, checking and fixing if necessary. Right. I'm assuming that's what it means. Right. We don't have to look it up. I think we're fine to guess from the way that he used the word. I think we could tell. Another phrase he used here that you might not know is rule of thumb. You see that there? It says just a rule of thumb, surely. OK, so what is a rule of thumb? Normally, when we use the phrase rule of thumb, we are talking about it is an idiom, but it basically just means it's not a real official rule. It's just something that people often say that might be true. 
So it really is something that maybe it might be true. A lot of people seem to believe it, so it could be smart, good wisdom, but we're not, we're not, we don't know for sure. What we call that a rule of thumb, you know? So what rules of thumb can you think of in your culture? Like, I'll think of another rule of thumb. Uh, they said that you shouldn't leave your milk out. Well, at least you should keep your milk in the refrigerator as much as possible. Don't leave it out any longer than it needs to be outside of your refrigerator. And why? Well, obviously, you know, milk does spoil when it's left at room temperature. It spoils faster. I don't know if it needs to be put in the refrigerator immediately. If it's left out for five minutes, 10 minutes, I don't think it would make a big difference, but it's a rule of thumb that you should put the milk back in the refrigerator as soon as possible. Don't leave it out any longer than necessary. That's a rule of thumb. It's wise to follow it, even though it may not be an official thing or something that's scientifically proven. So you can think of those as kind of rules of thumbs. It's not the same thing as a custom, you know, taking off your shoes when you enter the house is a custom, right? Right. But like a rule of thumb might be, you know, uh, a, a rule of thumb might be to bring house, house shoes with you when you visit someone's house, right? It's a good idea to, to bring house your, home, your own house shoes with you. Not because you don't know if their their house the floor will be clean, and you don't know if they'll have house shoes or slippers for you to wear. So it might be a good idea when visiting someone's house to bring your own house shoes. That's a rule of thumb. It's not necessarily something that you have to do or that you must do, but uh, it's a good idea, a rule of thumb. The same thing goes for the fact that dogs age for, seven times faster than we do. It's not exactly that. We don't know scientifically that it's true, but it's often said, and we do know that dogs do age much, much faster than we do, and they do live about one seventh of our life of our lifetime, a little bit more, but something like that. So we call that a rule of thumb. Uh, we've wasted enough time on that, I think. Now let's move on to the next page. You're somebody, I thought, as I went back to my bike, which was true. But as it happened, I was a busy somebody. In addition to baseball, I was thinking of trying out for the end of year play, high school musical. I had fantasies of singing Breaking Free with Gina Pastorelli, who was a senior and gorgeous. A woman bundled up in a tartan coat was standing by my bike. I thought she was Mrs. Ragland, or maybe it was Reagan. Are you the one who called the ambulance, she asked. Yes, ma'am, I said. How bad is he, Bowditch? I don't really know. He broke his leg for sure. Well, that was your good deed for the day, maybe for the year. He's not much of a neighbor, keeps mostly to himself, but I've got nothing against him except for the house, which is an eyesore. You're George Reed's son, aren't you? That's right. She held out her hand. Althea Richland. I shook with her. Pleased to meet you. What about the mutt? That's a scary dog, a German shepherd. He used to, he used to walk with him, he, Oh, well, hold on. He used to walk him early mornings and sometimes after dark when the kids were inside. She pointed to the sadly sagging picket fence. That certainly wouldn't hold him. It's a her, and I'm taking care of her. Oh, that's very good of you. I hope you won't be, get bitten. Oh, she's pretty old now, not and not mean. To you, maybe, Mrs. Richland said. My father had a saying. An old dog will bite twice as hard. A reporter from that rag of a weekly of a weekly came by and asked me what happened. I think he's the one who does the call outs. Police, fire, ambulance, that kind of thing. She sniffled. He looked about your age. 
I'll keep that in mind, I said, not knowing why I should. I better get going, Miss Richland. I want to visit Mr. Bowditch before school. She laughed. If it's Arcadia, visiting hours don't start until nine. They'll never let you in this early. Okay, so now we've gotten to the end of the section. Let's go to the first page that we had read in this reading. Okay, so not much happens here. He's leaving Mr. Bowditch's house, and in leaving Mr. Bowditch's house, he finds uh, that there is a woman outside waiting for him by his, her, his bicycle. She asks him. Sorry, I don't understand. Hmm. She asks him if she is who he is, and then she wants to make sure because she knows that there is some reporter of some kind, a very young reporter, that seems to be one who that seems to want to interview him, perhaps about the emergency that he helped with. Uh, of course, his name is George Reed. I keep thinking of him as Charlie, but okay, his name is George Reed, not Charlie Reed. And of course, so in this case, uh, yeah, he he speaks to her. It's a very polite conversation. Of uh, I think there might be just one or two phrases that might be useful to you that you might not know. Uh, of course, if you really want them all explained, you really need to join the event. But um, since you're not here, I'll have to think of one, some that I think are kind of useful. Okay, so like, yeah, here we go. All right. Okay, here we have this, this phrase, keeps mostly to himself. That could be useful for you, especially if you're living in Japan, because people generally do that in Japan more so than in America or other countries. Keep to himself. What does it mean to keep to oneself? Now, you could probably get, you could probably guess what that means, but just to, to make it a teachable moment, I'll tell you to keep to yourself is to not socialize too much. You don't talk to others very much. It's not the same thing as being shy, though. When you're shy, you are either scared or uncomfortable in social situations. Someone who keeps to themselves, that just means that they're not, in, they're not interested in communicating a lot. If someone communicates with them, they may not be uncomfortable, they may not be shy. It's rather strange for someone to be shy as an adult, in the Western culture at least. So we would just say that he keeps to himself, right? Not so much that they are shy. And you can find many, many people in your neighborhood, I'm sure, who keep to themselves. In fact, I would imagine most of your neighbors do that. Mm -hmm. We have also that it said that the, the woman was bundled up in a tartan coat, uh, or well, not tartan, I said tartan, but it's called a tartan coat. And a tartan coat is basically, well, it's, it's almost like a, it's like a, I forgot what kind of coat they used to call it. But in any event, you could think of tartan as like the tartan print, right? Or it's a certain kind of print that you actually wear. So the pattern of the coat is called tartan print. And so a tartan coat, I'm assuming, is a, is a coat like that with, with tartan print. But uh, unfortunately, at the moment, I cannot remember what the, the, the long coat that, that people wear oftentimes in this winter and in the fall. But OK, I can't remember. But that, what bundled up was the question, right? To bundle up. To bundle is to gather into a, one bunch, right? So if someone is bundled up, what, they mean, what that means is everything that they're wearing, they have gathered into a bunch to keep them warm. So if you can imagine she's wearing a coat, she's wearing a scarf, she, maybe she's got gloves, and she's got it all bundled up under her chin, right? Because she's cold. So that's bundled up, bundled in a tartan coat. That might be something that you might find useful. To have something bundled up means to have it grouped or wrapped tightly, usually for warmth or comfort. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And OK. The next page, I think there was a word there that I would like to re review with you. Mm. 
Now, look, okay, no, I don't, I don't, I don't think there's really anything here that I would want to explain. Uh, of course, if there's something you don't understand, you want to be sure to join us so that we can discuss it and you can improve your English. But for now, let's move on to section two of this chapter, chapter three. They did though, explaining that I had school and baseball practice after didn't quite convince the lady at the front desk. But when I told her I was the one who called the ambulance, she told me I could go up. Room 322, elevators are on your right. Halfway down the, the third floor hall, a nurse asked me if I was here to see how, Howard Bowditch. I said, I was, and asked how he was doing. He's had one operation and is going to need another. Then he'll be facing a fairly long period of convalescence. And he'll need a lot of physical therapy. Melissa Wilcox will probably be the one to take that on. The leg break was a particularly bad one, and he all and and he also and he also pretty much destroyed his hip. It will it will need a replacement. Otherwise, he'll be spending the rest of his life on a walker or in a wheelchair, no matter how much therapy he does. Gee, I said, does he know? The doctor who has set the break will have will have told him what he needs to know right now. You called the ambulance? Yes, ma'am. Well, you may have saved his life. Between the shock and possibly spending a night outdoors, she shook her head. It was the dog. I heard the dog howling. Did the dog call 911? I admitted that had been me. Okay, so of course he's now talking with a nurse who's explaining his condition. Uh, so, so Mr. Bowditch has got a pretty big problem here. Not only did he break his leg, but maybe his hip now needs to re be replaced. It looks like if they can't do the full amount of treatment for him, he may not be able to walk properly again. It's pretty big, pretty bad damage. And you can see in the end, uh, the nurse is trying to give credit to, um, to uh, George for having called 911 and, and very much probably saving his life. But, but, but George, as usual, wants to credit the dog, who was the one who got his attention. Um, and of course, they had a back and forth about that, where of course he had to admit, yes, he was the one who did call 911. So uh, the nurse's name is Melissa Wheel Wilcox. Uh, I don't know if there were any words in here that I'd like to stop to talk about. I think there was one, but I just, I, you know, I moved past it so quickly that I just don't remember what it was. So I guess we'll just have to move on. Uh, and of course, oh yeah, that's it, the word convalesce. There we go. The nurse says, then he'll be facing a fairly long period of convalescence. Convalescence. So convalescence is a noun, but it comes from the verb convalesce. Can you guess what it means to convalesce? From this context, if you had guessed it was anything like getting better or heal or improve your health then or recover then you are correct yes Con convalesce to convalesce means to recover or to return to good health or to good condition so if convalesce the verb means to recover then convalescence the noun simply means recovery so you'll have a long period of recovery it will take him a long time to recover. So there, we've got a more advanced word that we can use there instead of heal or instead of recover, we can say heal. I mean, we could say convalesce or convalescence as a noun. Mm -hmm. So that could be useful to you. Write that down in your notebook if you have one. And we're moving on. If you want to see him, you better go down. I just gave him a shot for pain and it'll probably be put him under before long. 
Broken leg and hip aside, he's severely underweight. Easy, easy pickings for osteoporosis. You might get 15 minutes before he's off to see the wizard. Okay, so now you can see there, they, they're saying that they gave him a drug that's probably going to make him go to sleep. Of uh, she says that he's very, he's very underweight, slim, pick, easy pickings, easy pickings. When we say, I like this phrase, easy pickings. When we use this phrase, easy pickings, it means it's an easy target, or or it's not a hard target to hit, or not a hard, not a hard thing to 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 do. So, for example, osteoporosis is a is a disease of the bone. And if someone has osteoporosis, it's, it, that means they have nothing but bones. So we could say it's easy pickings for osteoporosis because they are bony, because they are skinny, they're underweight. So osteoporosis could easily set in for someone who is underweight. Basically, they're saying it will be easy for him to catch osteoporosis. But easy pickings is a good phrase. You want to look out for that phrase. Catch it a few more times before you ever try to use it. But yeah, whenever something you, you, is an easy target to achieve or something that's easy to accomplish, we would say it's easy pickings, right? So that's a useful phrase. And then of course they use this phrase, he's off to see the wizard. Now, depending on how old you are or how, how well-versed you are in American culture, you might not, you might or might not know this phrase, off to see the wizard. But it comes from an old movie, I would say, I, I want to say the movie was filmed in the 30s, 40s maybe, possibly 50s. <laughs> I'm not so good with the timing in Hollywood. But it was called The Wizard of Oz. And of course, off to see the wizard, off means we're going. And to see the wizard, we're going to see the wizard. It means uh, I, I, that that whole story was about a woman who was lost in a in an imaginary land or some fantasy land and wanted to get back home, and she needed to find the wizard of this place in order to go back home. It was a musical feature, so one of the the, the very the most popular theme songs was "We're Off to See the Wizard." Right, and so they often sang, "We're off to see the wizard, the wonderful wizard of Oz." Now, of course, at the end of this movie, it turns out that this was all a dream, and so she wakes up. All right, so of course, now as this nurse says, "He's off to see the wizard." Basically, what she's saying is it's sort of like a very clever way of saying that he is going to sleep. Right, he falls asleep. Right, so that's just sort of a play on that movie, and of course the the main character having been asleep the whole time, being off to see the wizard is Stephen King through this nurse, his way of saying, "Go to sleep, mm -hmm. off to see the wizard." Well, let's move on to part three, shall we? Okay. Mr. Bowditch's leg was up in a pulley contraption that looked straight out of the 1930s comedy movie. Only Mr. Bowditch wasn't laughing. Neither was I. The lines on his face looked deeper, almost carved. The dark circles under his eyes were darker. His hair appeared lifeless and thin, the red streaks in it looking faded. I guess he had a roommate but I never saw him because a green drape was drawn across the other half of the th of 322. Mr. Bowditch saw me and tried to straighten up in his bed, which made him grimace and hiss out a breath. Hello there. What's your name again? If you told me, I don't remember, which given the circumstances might be forgivable. I couldn't remember if I'd either, so I gave it again or for the first time then asked him how he was feeling. Extremely shitty. Just look at me. I'm sorry. Not as sorry as I am. Then with an effort to be civil, thank you, young Mr. Reed. They tell me you may have saved my life. Doesn't feel like it's worth much just now, but as the Buddha supposedly said, it changes. Sometimes for the better, Although, in my experience, that's rare. I told him, as I had my father, the, MT, the EMTs and, Mrs., and Mrs. Richland, 
that it was really the dog who had saved him. If I hadn't heard her howling, I would have biked on by. How is she? Fine. I took a chair by his bed and showed him the pictures. I taken I, I, I took a bit, one more time. Fine. I took a chair by his bed and showed him the pictures I'd taken of Radar with her monkey. He went back and forth between them several times. I had to show him how to do that. The pics made him seem happier, if not necessarily any healthier. Facing a long period of convalescence, the nurse had said. When he handed the phone back, the smile was gone. They haven't told me how long I'm going to be in this damn sick bay, but I'm not stupid. I know it's going to be a while. I guess I need to think about putting her down. She's had a good life, but now her hips are. Jeez, don't do that, I said, alarmed. I'll take care of her, happy to do it. Okay, okay, so we'll stop there for a moment. Let's see if there's anything that we have read so far that we might want to stop to talk about. We saw that word convalescence popped up again. We know what that word means now. And the more that it's repeated, the more the meaning is reinforced. This is the value of reading books, right? But uh, I don't know. I don't remember there being any other special words or phrases. Oh, well, oh, maybe there's one here because you might not get this. In the end, he says, I guess I need to think about Putting her down, putting her down. So now when we put something down or put someone down, it has many meanings. Obviously we can pick something up and put it down, right? Also to put someone down could be to insult someone or to make someone feel bad. But in the case of an owner with their pet, when we say that we put them down, that actually means to have them killed uh, because they cannot be, they cannot be healed. Maybe they've gotten so sick and they're they're suffering too much. Then we've got to put them down, which means kill them, so that they don't suffer anymore. I know in in Japan where I live, people will just keep the dog until the dog just stops breathing. You know, but usually in America, when the dog cannot live a fulfilling life, if the dog cannot walk anymore or has has so much trouble breathing or just can't really function by, on his own, uh, then the owners usually do uh, decide to put them down. In fact, often at times the veterinarian recommends that so that the dog doesn't suffer needlessly. But different culture, yeah? So that phrase might not be useful in Japan because in general, people don't put animals down in Japan, but that is something we do use in the West. As responsible pet owners, we always have to decide when the pet is suffering so much that it's not worth it. And we ask the veter veterinarian to put them down. So that's one phrase that's useful. And so that's why you can see he responded with, geez, short for Jesus, of course, don't do that because he's, He's growing quite fond of the dog. He doesn't want to see the dog die, right? He's, he, he agrees to take care of it. He says, I'll take care of her, happy to do it. And now moving on. He looked at me and for the first time, his expression wasn't one of irritation or resignation. You do that? Can I trust you to do that? Yes, she's almost out of food but my dad's getting a bag of that origin stuff today. Six morning, six evening, I'll be there, count on it. He reached for me, maybe meaning to take my hand or at least give it a pat. <laughs> I would have allowed it, but he pulled his hand back. That's very good of you. I like her and she likes me. Does she? Good. She's not a bad old pal. His eyes were getting glassy, his voice a little slurry. Whatever the nurse had given him was starting to work. No harm in her, but she used to scare the shit out of the neighbor's kids, the neighborhood kids, which I appreciated. Nosy little brats, most of them, nosy and noisy. As for burglars, forget it. If they heard radar, they'd head for the hills. But now she's old. He sighed, then coughed. It made him wince. 
and she's not the only one. I'll take good care of her, maybe walk her down the hill or to my place. His eyes sharpened a little as he considered this possibility. She's never been in anyone else's since I got her as a pup, just my house, the yard. Okay, let's stop there for a moment. Do we see any words or phrases here that we don't understand? That we could we could stand to have explained. Um, nothing I can think of. I, I think hopefully, if you're reading along with us at this level, you probably heard the word burglars, right? Burglars, burglars to are people who burgle. To burgle is to steal someone is to, is to steal something from a place usually by sneaking in when, when no one is there or when no one notices and sneaking out, that is to burgle. So a burglar is someone who would try to sneak into your house, maybe late at night, take some things and sneak back out of the house. He's saying, as for burglars, forget it, right? If they heard radar, they'd head for the hills. Now that phrase, head for the hills, that's useful. He says, if the burglars hear Radar, who is the dog, they would head for the hills. Can you guess what head for the hills means? I mean, your English might be good enough to know that head means to just start to go somewhere, right? To head out, to start to go out, right? But to head for the hills, well, head for, that means that go in a direction, right? Why the hills? What does it mean? Well, without explaining the history of it, because I don't really know the history of it, I hope you could guess that head for the hills means run away, right? Obviously, if you look as far as possible, unless you live in a very flat land, if you look as far as possible, the farthest point would probably lead to a hill. That's where you can't see any further because there's a hill or a mountain. Usually, most lands, if you look as far as possible, it's going to, the farthest point will be some hill or mountain, right? So to head for the hills is to basically run far, far away, right? Or try to escape. So this implies that they are scared. When we are scared of something and we run away, it is often called heading for the hills. So that's a good phrase that you might want to chalk, what you might want to try to use in the future. It's a good idiom, right? To head for the hills. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really the only word we probably, or phrase we really didn't want to go into, given that we don't have much time. And I do want to finish at least this part of the chapter. So we're moving on to Mrs. Richland. Oh, let's have a sip of coffee, shall we? Okay, ready to go. Mrs. Richland said you took her on walks. The nosy Parker across the street? Well, yes, she's right. We did go on walks when Radar was able to go without getting tired. I'd be afraid to take her any distance now. What if I got her down Pine Street and she couldn't make it back? He looked down at himself. Now I'm the one who couldn't make it back. Couldn't make it anywhere. I won't push her, you know, overtax her. He relaxed. I'll pay you for what she eats and for your time, that too. Don't worry about it. She might be okay for a while, yet when I get home, if I get home, if I get home, you will, Mr. Baldich. If you're going, feed her, better call me Howard. I didn't know if I could do that, but I agreed. Maybe bring me another picture? Sure. I better go, Mr. Howard. You should rest up. No choice. His eyes slipped closed. Then his lids slowly came up again. Whatever she gave me, whoo, high tension stuff. His eyes closed again. I got up and headed for the door. Boy, what was your name again? Charlie, thank you, thank you, Charlie. I thought maybe give her another chance. Not for me, once was enough for me. Life gets to be a burden. If you live long enough, you'll find that out for yourself. But her, Radar, and then I got old and fell off the fucking ladder. 
I'll bring you some more pictures. You do that. I turned to go, then he spoke again, but I don't think it was for me. A brave man helps, a coward just gives presents. He fell silent and began to snore. Halfway down the hall, I saw the nurse I'd spoken to coming out of a room with, that, with what looked like a bag of cloudy pee. She saw me and put a towel over it. She asked if I had a nice visit. Yes, but he wasn't making much sense by the end. She smiled. Demerol will do that. Go on now. You should be in school. Okay. Okay, so well, let's look at that. All right, we have... Okay, he does. He talks to Mr. Bowditch about Mrs. Richland, and he says she's a nosy Parker across the street. I don't know what a Parker is in this case. He says nosy Parker, but... I'm going to assume that a nosy Parker just means like a nosy person. I think we can guess that. Nosy, if you don't know, it means that you like to stick your nose into other people's business. That's where the word nosy comes from. So basically, someone who likes to pay attention to, to likes to know things about other people's private lives, those are nosy people. Mm -hmm. So he sees a nosy Parker. He probably knew that already. And then let's see, uh, not much else here that you probably couldn't guess. Mm, mm. Yeah, now uh, here's an interesting thing. High tension stuff. Now, I think this is a useful phrase. I, I, you don't often hear this in English, but I, it, well, I think it's useful to talk about because I do often hear this phrase used in Japanese. Uh, when Japanese people say high tension, uh, what they usually mean is uh, exciting, right? Very exciting or, or, or very high energy, right? That's what high tension means in, when Japanese people say it. But in, in the English-speaking world, high tension literally means intense, very, very intense or strong, right? And if we use it to, explain, to describe a situation or a person, it could, it could really mean stressful, right? So it's not always a positive thing. In fact, it could be quite negative when we say something's high tension. In this case, he's talking about the medicine that he took. So he's saying the medicine is intense, it's powerful. That's what he means when he says high tension stuff. So that's how we use the phrase high tension. Otherwise, we don't often use the phrase high tension. So normally when native speakers are using the phrase high tension, we would rather use a phrase like uh, high energy, like I said, exciting, uh, or something like that, right? We wouldn't use the phrase high tension the way that Japanese people do. All right, so that's something to take into consideration as we go get to the end of this. Now, looking at the last page, let's see, were there any words or phrases? Okay, so now this, this whole paragraph here, okay, everything he's saying from this point, uh, I think Mr. Baldish is just really half dreaming, right? So he's actually like basically talking in his sleep at this point. He's half asleep and he's talking, so he says, Give her another chance, not for me, once was enough for me. We don't know what he's talking about. He must be reliv reliving some past experience or some past memory. Not for me, once was enough for me. Life gets to be a burden. Okay, so now while we don't know what he's talking about, it might be good to make sure we understand what the word burden means, if you can't guess what that means. When we say something is a burden, what we mean is that it is something that is troublesome for us to, to deal with. Maybe it's like a weight on our shoulders or something that's very heavy that we, that we need to carry. It's a trouble for us. We call it a burden. So anything that's troublesome for you, we might say, oh, it's a burden. In fact, we could take the word trouble and the way we turn that into troublesome, we could also say something is burdensome and it has that same or similar meaning, right? So there's a useful word that you could use. A lot of times if, if, if someone offers to help you and you want to decline, you might say, oh, I don't want to be a burden, 
right? That means I don't want to be trouble for you. I don't want to be uh, to to make you to make you have to make an extra effort for any reason, right? So that word burden it could be a useful word to know. But as I said, what he's saying it in here and in this context, we really don't know. But it's just it seems as though he's really just half asleep and just talking nonsensically, which is why in the end. George says, oh, yeah, I couldn't understand. I couldn't make an oh, he he wasn't making much sense by the end. That basic basically that means he couldn't understand what the what uh, Mr. Bowditch was saying, what Howard was saying, right? And of course, Demerol is a very powerful anesthetic, makes you go to sleep. And so that's why he could not stay awake. So he has finished his hospital visit. The nurse it finishes by telling him that he should be in school. And well, now we're up to, to, to set to part four, right? We've got only, we've got four, and we've got only four minutes to go. Leafing through this, I think we've got maybe part four has is, is very short. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read part four in its entirety. Let's challenge ourselves, see if I can get it done in four minutes, and then we'll go over, a little over to discuss any words that we didn't understand or that we sh I think we should talk about. Okay, so let's begin. By the time I got to Hillview, period two had been going on for, for 10 minutes and the halls were empty. I went to the office to get an excuse late from Mrs. Silvius, a nice old lady with scary blue hair. She had to be at least 75, long past the usual retirement age, but still plenty sharp and good, good humored. I think good humor because it must be necessary when you're dealing with teenagers. I hear you saved a man's life yesterday, she said as she signed the slip. Who told you that? A little birdie, tweet, tweet, tweet. Word gets around, Charlie. I took the slip. It really wasn't me. It was the guy's dog. I heard her howling. I was getting tired of telling people this because nobody believed me, which was strange. I thought everyone liked stories about hero dogs. I just called 911. Whatever you say, now run along to class. Can I show you something first? Only if it's a speedy something. I took out my phone and showed her the picture I'd snapped of Mr. Valdich's TV. That's an antenna on top, right? Rabbit ears, we called them, Mrs. Sil Mrs. Sylvia said. Her smile was very similar to the one Mr. Bowditch had worn when he was looking at the pictures of a radar with her monkey. We used to put tinfoil on the tips of, our of ours because it was supposed to improve the reception. But look at the television, Charlie. My goodness, does it actually work? I don't know. I didn't try it. The first TV we ever had looked like this, a table model Zenith. It was so heavy, my father strained his back carrying it up the steps to the apartment we lived, back, lived in back then. We watched that thing by the hour. Annie Oakley, Wild Bill Hitchcock, oh, Wild Bill Hickok, Captain Kangaroo, Crusader Rabbit, gosh, until we got headaches. And once it wouldn't work, the picture had just rolled and rolled. So my dad called a TV repairman who came with a suitcase full of tubes. Tubes? Vacuum tubes. They glowed orange like old fashioned light bulbs. We, he replaced the one that had gone bad and it worked just fine again. She looked at the picture on my phone once more. Surely the tube for this one would have burned out long ago. Mr. Bowditch probably bought you more on bought, bought more on eBay or Craigslist, I said. You can buy anything on the internet, if you can afford it, that is. Only I didn't think Mr. Bowditch did internet. Mrs. Sylvius handed my phone back. Go along, Charlie. Physics awaits for you. Phys physics awaits you. Okay, so I'm a little bit confused as to why this character is sometimes called Charlie and sometimes called George. He seems to call himself George Reed. Oh, no, no, maybe he's George Reed's son. So his father's name is George. His name is Charlie. I think that's how it is. He is George Reed's son. His father is George. He is Charlie. Okay, that's it. That's it. Okay, so I had his name right. His name is Charlie. 
And uh, okay, so nothing much happens here. He just gets to school and he's talking to the nurse. He explains to the nurse that uh, he went to the hospital so he could get a, an excuse slip, a special paper that says that it's okay that he was late. Uh, what else happened? He shows the, the, the uh, I guess the school principal, a picture of Mr. Bowditch's TV. I'm not exactly sure why. Uh, but he, I, I guess he maybe wants to do something to help repair it or see if it will work. And he asked about it, of course. Then the, the principal then explains about how her childhood, she used the television like that and on and on it went. To be honest, I do remember also being a child and having a television. I don't know that it used, it, it, was, it didn't use tubes, but it was a really big TV tube. I had a Sony Trinitron, and I, I think that was, my mother bought that. It was so heavy, it couldn't be picked up. It was like a whole furniture unit, the size of a table, and it had to be rolled. It, it, was, it had wheels, I believe, and had to be rolled into the house. And uh, that was a great time, but yeah, those were, those were the days, yeah? So I do remember the old TV, but even that, that TV, I think it had push buttons and a remote control and, those kinds of things, you know, the older TVs like Mr. Bowditch probably didn't have that. Maybe Mr. Bowditch TV, uh, Zenith, they said, the table type Zenith, it's like it probably has little knobs that you turn to turn the channels. I We did have that before the Sony Trinitron, but I don't remember much of that. You know, I was much, much younger. But in any event, we're not going to go over any vocabulary in that last section because it was fairly short, so we could get through it pretty easily. And we have reached the closing time. This time next week, we should be able to continue with us and with uh, section five, and hopefully, we will finish chapter three. Of um, hopefully, uh, you will want to join if you have if you are watching this out there live or if you're watching this recorded. Uh, like I said, uh, we are offering that you can join. Just sign up at the bottom of the web page, and then what we can do is we can take this private so that you can show your face if you'd like. We can keep it public. Of uh, if we if we keep it public, uh, then obviously you don't have to pay for that because it's. It's public, all right. But if you want to take it, take it private. This lesson with this this group, this event is one thousand one hundred yen per event, so we can do that. And if you want to pay that, then we certainly will take it private, and other people will not be able to see you, and that would be fine. Okay. Hopefully, we will be seeing more people join us. But if not, that's perfectly fine because I do enjoy reading this. I get a lot more read by myself, obviously, and and I I do want to uh, read this book. And so I hopefully will be able to continue this no matter who joins until the end of this book. Uh, that would be amazing if it could happen. In any event, I hope to see you again soon. Always remember. Be prepared and never hesitate to join the Real English Party online and in life. And I'll see you soon. Bye for now.